What happens when Sekiro goes to Harada Estate? This is three years in the past. It can't be just a memory, because he still has the prosthetic and all his power-ups, and he can bring stuff from here back to the present, like the flame barrel and the shinobi axe. Maybe it's time travel, but that doesn't quite make sense either. After Lady Butterfly, Kuro grants this version of Sekiro his resurrective power, which he already has. This should be happening to some past version of Sekiro. Also, if this is time travel, then the second visit would change the past. You kill Al, but this doesn't appear to change that you also killed him three years later. You kill Masanaga, but in the present, he's still alive. Cause and effect here is totally screwed up. This whole section of the game is somehow a blend of memory and ongoing experience, past and present. Miyazaki has said in interviews that his games have information intentionally left out so that an unambiguous linear narrative is impossible to construct, forcing players to engage with their own imaginations. At first, it seems like this is not the case with this game, but Harada Estate, along with some other less obvious discrepancies, shows that it is. Video games, more generally, require their audiences to participate in telling the story. If you never touch the controller, no story happens. It's also common for video games to have multiple endings. Despite all this, From Software fans are intent on identifying single, canonical interpretations of each game's story, spending a lot of mental energy searching for plot linkages that carry no meaning. In film and literary analysis, interpretation is the norm, despite those media being less interactive. In that spirit, rather than try to resolve the ambiguity in Sekiro, I'm going to find meaning in it. It reflects something about the character's emotional experience, which is itself ambiguous and irrational, and connects the game in a meaningful way to emotional experiences in the real world. <laughs> Sekiro is a troubled man. Certain NPCs can see it on his face. We can see it too, even in the marketing. He's also really antisocial. もしこまったらうちで雇って差し上げやしょう。断る。はい。愛想のないこった。まあ、そう来るわな。これは。<笑> When you lay out the details of his life story, his behavior makes him look like someone with post-traumatic stress disorder. His personal history is full of stuff that's known to cause PTSD. 
For one, he's a combat veteran. PTSD as a diagnosis has its origins in the treatment of World War I veterans, and combat remains the most widely recognized cause of traumatic stress. The game is set entirely within the context of war, and it shows us a really ugly side of war, how it damages people, their bodies, but also their minds. Sekiro's exposure to combat goes all the way back to early childhood. This ties directly to another sign that he has PTSD. He was abused as a child. The most direct evidence is the description of the inner father battle memory. Al once abandoned the young wolf in Usui Forest, expecting him to fend against the illusions, likely never to return. Only in victory would he recognize the boy as his son. In this way, in this way alone, he raised the wolf as his own. It's also implied through the pervasive theme of child exploitation, and in the way Sekiro is treated by the parental figures in his life. This explains his lack of social skills, and why he has such difficulty talking about emotions, even other people's emotions. <laughs> I was abused by my father, and there's a moment between phases in the first Al fight that feels like a scene from my own life. Not that my dad would attack me with a sword, but he would try to elicit feelings of pity and guilt from me, and then use those feelings to hurt me. Abuse in childhood can be a direct cause of PTSD, and survivors of child abuse are said to be softened up and more easily affected by traumatic stress if they encounter it in adulthood. Another sign is that Sekiro gets dismembered. Unsurprisingly, people who suffer major bodily injuries sometimes develop PTSD, but this is also relevant to PTSD in a less literal way. Sekiro's mastery of the prosthetic represents a new concept of himself that he has to create in response to his trauma. Finally, he literally dies. Death is a major theme in the study of PTSD, but this scene also figuratively expresses the emotional experience of PTSD. To the extent that a coherent chronology exists in this game, this is Sekiro's first resurrection. In his book The Evil Hours, David J. Morris, a combat veteran with PTSD, explores the subject of this disorder through psychiatric and historical research and through the subjective experiences of himself and others. Throughout this book, Morris talks about PTSD as a figurative resurrection. Major traumas are both a death and a rebirth. After trauma, your mind works differently, and your body has been altered to the extent that an entire new understanding of it must be negotiated. PTSD is caused by an overloading of the amygdala. Oh, amygdala. The amygdala. A region of the brain important for the processing of emotion and memory. People with PTSD often have amnesia specific to the details of their traumatic experience. In video games, amnesia is usually a lazy way to put the player in the same shoes as the character. But in this game, it's a meaningful part of the character's story arc. Sekiro specifically can't remember anything that happened at Harada Estate. <laughs> Even after revisiting that night, he can't remember that it's Al who stabbed him in the back. This particular moment is buried deepest because it's the traumatic experience that incited his disorder, the straw that broke the camel's back. Sekiro receives a wound that's severe physically, so much so that he has to be resurrected from the dead, but also severe emotionally, because it's inflicted by someone who he trusts implicitly. As Morris explains, context can make traumatic events more likely to cause PTSD. It is not merely the blunt force of trauma that matters, so much as how it impacts one's social environment and one's interpretation of the social environment. Inevitably, repressed traumatic memories will intrude involuntarily on a person's awareness, sometimes in detail so vivid that it's like a hallucination. These are flashbacks. <laughs> They occur not only on a sensory level, but also on a cognitive level, leaving people unable to distinguish between memory and present reality. Morris's descriptions of flashbacks sound a lot like the unresolved past-present ambiguity of Harada Estate. The horrific event lives on and evolves, melding with the present, or conversely, it has come to encompass one's entire history, past, present, and future. In its worst forms, trauma can almost completely destroy not only a person's sense of time, but also the very Western idea of time as a linear concept, of moving from one minute to the next. 
These unincorporated memories insist on being noticed, and in their insistence, they come to haunt the minds of the survivors, destroying their perception of time. They are, at varying times and to varying degrees, living in different times and in different places. Though flashbacks are the most extreme form, these intrusive thoughts and memories manifest in a variety of ways. For example, psychiatric research records that veterans see ghosts, demons, and other paranormal phenomena in nightmares and hallucinations. And similar accounts by veterans are commonly described in art, literature, and historical records that predate the scientific study of psychology. This is the influence of culture. As practically any therapist will tell you, many of the long-term effects of trauma are the product of the emotional interpretations of events by victims. Interpretations that are informed by the archetypal narratives that exist with a given culture, a process that is explicitly literary. From the very beginning, the game goes out of its way to let you know that Sekiro can read, unlikely for a pleb like Sekiro in this era. So it's reasonable to suppose that he's familiar with the stories and beliefs that these ghosts and demons are based on. Most are found underground, underwater, otherwise beneath or within the environment, or removed from the more grounded socially real environments in the game. This is a common way for art to represent a character's inner psychological experience. Morris uses this same metaphor. The war had touched me so deeply that it had granted me access to the darkest chambers of the mind. The writing, whatever else it did, took me to the same place that a lot of veterans ended up, the dark cave of my head, where the only sound was the echo of my own voice. So does famed neurologist Oliver Sacks when he discusses PTSD and hallucinations. The dissociations of PTSD are of a more radical kind. For the unbearable sights, sounds, smells, and emotions of the hideous experience get locked away in a separate subterranean chamber of the mind. To be clear, I'm not saying that in the story these things are just hallucinations. It's pretty obvious that other people can also see these things. I don't think this is Jacob's Ladder, the game. I'm talking about their meaning on a less literal level, outside of the story. The opening cutscene explicitly situates the game at the end of the Sengoku period, late in the 16th century. Earlier in the 16th century, Japanese society began adopting European practices of medicine, reflected in the game by Emma and Dojin, disciples of the same teacher. Dojin's mindless reanimated corpses symbolize the separation of mind and body that has historically dominated the scientific, medicalist view of psychiatry. In the 1940s, thousands of veterans were lobotomized to treat what was then called shell shock. Today, the cutting edge of PTSD treatment uses drugs. Morris sees a continuity from the lobotomies to the drugs, and he's suspicious of this approach to therapy. If a cure for post-traumatic stress can be found, then society as a whole won't have to bother with trying to deal with the events that cause trauma, which have deep roots in social justice issues. More often than not, it is the powerless and the disenfranchised who are traumatized. Any honest attempt to deal with the problem of PTSD must begin with the commitment to reduce the sources of trauma that are under human control. War, genocide, torture, and rape. Emma's medicinal gourd and dragon rock cure represent pharmacology. She is compassionate, but look at the ending where Sekiro is in her care. For many people with PTSD, depression and social withdrawal become a lifelong struggle. Notice that Sekiro is no longer using the prosthetic, the symbol of his ability to adjust. I watch a lot of people on Twitch playing Sekiro for the first time. There's a question that often comes up when Ashina is invaded, either from the streamers themselves or in chat. Why are they hostile to Sekiro? They have some awareness of who he is and what he's doing. <laughs> They know about the resurrective power that Kenichiro is cultivating. If Sekiro's mission succeeds, it will help them win the war. It doesn't make sense strategically that they would attack him, but it does make sense thematically. You can put a precise date on the story because of the Ashina clan. Although the game changes all of the details, the Ashina clan was real. It was extinguished in 1589, during the consolidation of political power under the Tokugawa shogunate. This is who the game refers to as the Central Ministry. Ashina 
In the Edo period that followed, the shogunate totally reorganized society, formalizing a strict system of inherited social caste. This system officially excluded certain people from society because their occupations or the places where they lived were considered impure. They were forced to live in segregated communities and designated by terms that literally translate to great filth and non-human. They lacked all of the legal rights of ordinary citizens. For a small subset, this status was potentially temporary, but for most of them it was permanent, and they passed it on to their children. Although the caste system was abolished in the 19th century, their descendants are discriminated against to this day. Nearly all of Sekiro's allies, and a lot of his enemies, are in this group. This includes anyone who works around death, like the merchants of the memorial mob. <laughs> And Kotaro, if you send him to work for Anayama. It includes beggars. It includes traveling musicians and courtesans like Orin. It includes people who hunt for meat, like the outcasts in Mibu village. What these villagers don't know is that everyone who lives here is destined to be an outcast, because this exclusion eventually applied to anyone who lived near a low-lying riverbed, thought to be a source of pollution. The stress of class oppression is communicated by these character models. They're bent from their labors. They're small, which in From Software's visual language means that they have very little power. Because caste is determined according to a strictly codified ancestral lineage, war orphans, like Sekiro and Emma, with no family name and no formal connection to their ancestors, would also have reduced social status. For different reasons, but with similar results. Ishin gives Sekiro his name. Sekiro. And there's a powerful significance in this. Ishin is the political and social leader of Sekiro's community, the arbiter of identity. The DLC came with a new skin that turned Sekiro into the sculptor when he was young. It tells us about the prestige attached to names given by Ishin. The memory of a shinobi that once served Ashina. It is accompanied by a debt of gratitude to the one who took his arm and graced him with the name, Sekijo. Various characters refer to Sekiro in a few different ways. Wolf, Shinobi of the Divine Heir. But Sekiro is the name shared by the game itself. It's his true name. Prior to this, he had no identity. Had things been different, Sekiro might have risen in status like Yobu and Genichiro. Born a peasant, Genichiro Ashina was taken in by the Ashina after his mother's death. Yobu Oniwa once led a group of infamous bandits, but was defeated by Ishin, who was so captivated by his show of strength that he took him in as an Ashina warrior. Oniwa would later go on to become Genichiro Ashina's most trusted retainer. This mobility corresponds to the real history of this time period. The concept of an unclean subpopulation was already emerging in the Sengoku period. The time period covered by the game fully encompasses its origin, but it never amounted to total social exclusion before the imposition of a caste system. By opposing Genichiro, Sekiro is fighting for his own oppression. Mental illnesses like PTSD are not politically neutral. This was observed all the way back in 1945 by Otto Feinischel. Neuroses do not occur out of biological necessity like aging. Neuroses are social diseases corresponding to a given and historically developed social milieu. They cannot be changed without corresponding change in the milieu. Marginalized people are more frequently exposed to traumatic stress, and the experience of marginalization is itself traumatic. The philosophy of absolute deference to parental authority that Al imposes on Sekiro <laughs> anticipates the patriarchal social order of the Edo period. Lady Butterfly, for her part in Sekiro's indoctrination, is linked to the history of class oppression by the illusions she summons. They are ghostly duplicates of the Mibu villagers. Ancestral social hierarchy is a fiction, forced into reality by an abuse of authority. The abuse and isolation inflicted on Sekiro is a metaphor for the bigotry and exclusion in the world that Sekiro is inadvertently helping to create. So does this make him the bad guy? Is Genichiro actually the hero of this story? 
Well, it's not like either the Sengoku period or the Edo period were better than the other. The violence of the Sengoku period wasn't a necessary price for its relative, and I stress relative, degree of egalitarianism. The antagonistic Tokugawa social hierarchy was equally unnecessary for the peace and stability of that period. It was just convenient for the ruling classes. Ultimately, it's a mistake to draw any conclusions about history from this game. It's consistent and exact about being factually wrong. It makes a collage out of pop culture imagery that a Japanese audience would understand to be about this specific time period, and then flips it all around. It's like a samurai movie that's held up to a funhouse mirror, a distortion of a distortion. Since we can't trust the game about history, we should instead use its historical references to draw conclusions about its fictional narrative. From this point of view, the collapse of Ashina society symbolizes the collapse of Sekiro's social identity. I will say that Genichiro is a more than sympathetic villain. His motivation is understandable, to an extent even righteous. But in terms of the game's overall themes, he is wrong, because he's trying to hold back change. In order for Sekiro to address his trauma, he has to change. PTSD is commonly experienced, on an emotional level, as the end of the entire world. Life under Ashina rule, service to Kuro, and submission to Al is the extent of what Sekiro knows about society, and all of that burns away after his father stabs him in the back. There can be good in this, though. For many people who emerge from severe trauma, the necessity for re-evaluating their personal relationships and their core assumptions about the world creates profoundly positive results, even alongside symptoms of PTSD. In psychology, this phenomenon is called post-traumatic growth. The course of a person's post-traumatic growth is charted by the landmarks of their cultural beliefs. We know that Sekiro is a deeply religious person. Most of his permanent power-ups and temporary buffs are literally prayer. The game even credits the theological advisor. Imagery suggesting that his religious beliefs are in doubt is, frankly, heavy-handed. In all but one ending, Sekiro's Buddhist values are reaffirmed. In particular, the devotion of oneself to the service of others. Research specifically cites this as a sign of post-traumatic growth for Buddhists. For Sekiro, this manifests in his evolving service to Kuro. Kuro encourages Sekiro to separate himself from the role Al reduced him to, and to see himself as an individual with his own agency. <laughs> Sekiro's service-oriented personal growth is expressed most strongly in the return ending, when he consciously adopts a new purpose in service to the divine child of the rejuvenating waters. The western land they leave in search of is a reference to the otherworldly realm where practitioners of pure land Buddhism seek to reincarnate, which always lies to the west, everywhere in the world it's practiced. Enlightenment can be sought more easily here than in the corrupted mortal world. A pure land sect is the most widely practiced form of Buddhism in Japan, especially among the lower classes. The quest that Sekiro and the child are embarking on is a renewed commitment to the search for spiritual enlightenment. This is the most unambiguously good ending, which you can arrive at by respecting the small and weak, and by paying close attention to their point of view. Sekiro learns from the children, and from Emma, to accept help from others, another milestone in post-traumatic growth. We can see this in the exchange of rice, a literal source of nourishment. The description of the sweet rice ball suggests a transference from the harmful relationship with Al to the nurturing relationship with Kuro. Once, when the wolf was starving, his father wordlessly handed him a rice ball. It was astoundingly delicious. This one is sure to taste just as good. With all the narrative and thematic threads that tie into it, it's remarkable how one choice, to break the Iron Code, contains so many elements of post-traumatic growth. First and foremost, it's a direct rejection of Al's malignant personal authority. It's also a conscious affirmation of Sekiro's newly learned perspective, and the clearest declaration of his own individuality and agency. The player can refuse all this, go full incel, and give in to the cycle of abuse and violence, an all too common outcome for people who have suffered trauma. Incidentally, this was the ending I chose on my first playthrough, because I was annoyed about taking orders from a little kid. I actually think that Kuro and the child are the most poorly written parts of the game. They look like children, but they act like adults, functioning as surrogate parents to Sekiro. This sort of works thematically, because it's about respecting the weak and the vulnerable, and on a symbolic level it's about recognizing one's own needs and weaknesses. Ignoring both the children's quests is like a failure for Sekiro to confront his childhood trauma. If you do this, you can get the ending where Sekiro commits suicide, or the ending where he betrays Kuro and becomes a monster. 
But it serves this theme imperfectly, because this is in no way a story about caring for children. I think it would have worked a lot better if Sekiro had to deal with the fear and need for comfort that real children would have in these situations. What we get reminds me of a common trope in action and adventure stories, where a male protagonist is cast in the role of protector so that the story can explore his vulnerability without his masculinity being called into question. Strictly speaking, the Harada part of the game is optional. <laughs> It's even possible to miss it altogether. You can also skip all the dialogue and miss the eavesdrops. Eavesdropping on your friends is unhealthy in the real world, but it's the only way Sekiro knows how to learn, even about himself. If this is what your first playthrough is like, you'll have no narrative context for making a decision about the Iron Code, like a survivor avoiding any reminder of their trauma, and consequently any confrontation with their condition. Even if you reject Al's authority, you can go on ignoring other characters, and you'll only get the broken Sekiro from the default ending. Productive, growth-oriented trauma therapy is a process of replacing intrusive, involuntary thoughts and memories with what researchers call deliberate rumination, similar to how Sekiro powers up by confronting memories. According to the research, we all tell an ongoing story about ourselves. The goal of deliberate rumination is to reframe traumatic memories and revise this narrative with guidance from a therapist or an informal advisor. In the new narrative, the trauma is part of a story about the survivor's empowerment. With Emma's guidance, Sekiro revisits his memories of Harada Estate and copes with his worst trauma. Note that in this revised version of the memory, the statue doesn't topple over. However, Emma represents strictly pharmacological psychiatry, and saving Sekiro from suicide is beyond the limits of her practice. This reflects the high proportion of suicide among people who suffer with PTSD. Except for the Shura ending, all versions of this story involve Sekiro recovering a Sakura branch that Al stole, symbolically and to varying degrees repairing his emotional damage. <laughs> The branch is linked to the Divine Dragon, whose name in Japanese is more accurately translated as Sakura Dragon. The dragon is in turn visually linked to Sekiro, most conspicuously in its severed left arm. Personal transformation and post-traumatic growth can be a very rapid process, often described as a mystical event. In the game, the Divine Realm is an appropriate setting for such a transformation. Personally, I think the Fountainhead Palace is the ugliest area. It reminds me of an off-brand kids game. The preponderance of level planes, straight lines, and right angles makes it look like a cheap platformer, a Mario knockoff. The color palette makes me think of Fortnite. Sekiro's abuse has left his maturation deferred indefinitely. The creatures who live here feed off of his youth. <laughs> He has to push past his submerged childhood to reach his deepest unconscious, aka the Divine Realm. By grappling with the emotional pain that is poisoning him, he can create an empowered self-image that is rooted in that pain. His story about victimhood is replaced with a story about strength born from adversity. Appropriately, the dragon itself is an easy fight by this game's standards. Many attacks are either harmless or have an easy-to-execute counter, and is totally badass in an adolescent kind of way, like the cover of a power metal album. From Software's games are notable for the degree of harmony between the narrative and the experience of playing them. When you die in Dark Souls and get sent back to a checkpoint, this happens to your character too. It's part of the story. <laughs> In Sekiro, cutscenes that play every time you enter certain boss rooms get in the way of this, as though any previous failures are not experienced by Sekiro. If you really want to preserve the unity of gameplay and story, you can think of the entire game as a PTSD-induced hallucination or nightmare, and the constant repetition of these cutscenes as incessant compulsive cognition. The theme of illusion from the end of Harada Estate persists throughout the game. 
It's overt in certain areas, certain dialogue, and certain enemies. In a small, almost subliminal way. It's literally everywhere. A lot of what happens to Sekiro seems to echo Sekijo's personal history. ただひたすらに駆け飛びやいばを交える。そのような修行を重ねた時期、猿と河原のほどには向けるようになったが、一人か。いや、二人でじゃな。修行に飽きると。And there's strong identification between these two characters, visually and narratively, and also between their personalities. It's undeniable that Sekijo is reflected in Sekiro on a thematic level. Sekiro has the potential, depending on player choice, to embody Sekijo's better nature, still young, with time enough to find redemption, and extinguish what Sekijo despises in himself. The game gives us the option to look at this in a more literal way. Unlike other characters, Sekijo never faces the people he's speaking to. The game happens entirely behind his back, maybe in a sense in the back of his mind. Elsewhere in the game, there's references to dissociative identity disorder. Informally known as multiple personalities, it's a documented reaction to prolonged traumatic stress, especially in the very young. There is, subsequently, a degree of identification between Sekiro and Emma. Both symbolize vulnerability, discovered amidst a traumatically stressful circumstance. These figures of traumatized children could be seen as a visual code for a vulnerability discovered in oneself. Emma, with the capacity to accept others despite their flaws, emerged from her traumatic childhood and good mental health, thanks to the responsible parenting of Dogen, who also cared for Sekijo when he lost his arm. She's the part of Sekijo that can see himself in a positive light, because he could still find friendship with Dogen even after becoming Shura, which in my metaphorical take means becoming a violent abuser. There's no way to say for sure what bad things Sekijo did in the past, but his inmost regrets and obsessions are evoked through images exaggerated to match the intensity of his guilt that constantly intrude on his fantasy of redemption and forgiveness. This is probably a more radical reinterpretation than some people are interested in, and I'm going to set it aside. I can live with a reduced degree of ludonarrative harmony, and still draw conclusions from how the different parts of the game integrate. What From Software has become best known for are challenging boss fights, and Sekiro is the best example of that so far. Trauma survivors in real life are unable to inhibit their fear response, and have difficulty regulating their emotions, especially anxiety. Beating a boss in a From Software game isn't just a matter of learning movesets, you have to keep a cool head. This is more true in Sekiro than in any of their previous games. Mistakes are punished harshly, and panicking leads to a quick cascade of errors. This experience, the defining experience of a From Software game, is better integrated with the character and the story than in any of their previous titles because of the protagonist's dramatic backstory. The game as a whole is an analogy for the inner cognitive and emotional experience of someone with PTSD. And so at last, to answer the question, what happens when Sekiro goes to Harada Estate? He's face to face with the devastation of war, the same kind of stress behind his lingering trauma, and he's just found people who were there on the night of his repressed memories. This triggers a flashback. It's up to the player to find a way through this war and this personal crisis that brings Sekiro out alive and on the road to good mental health, with the sense of purpose he'll need to face new hardships in a changing world. Miyazaki's games have tight thematic coherence in their stories, flavor text, and game mechanics. I'm only making a big picture case here. 
mostly for the sake of brevity, but also to keep the tone conversational. My interpretation holds up, even when applied down to the smallest level of detail. Instead of me reproducing the game here in its entirety, I encourage you to play it again and see for yourself. Maybe you'll come up with a totally different interpretation. The game, like life, is full of contradictions that can't be resolved. Like memory and history, its past can't be fully understood. Look closely at it, hold it up at different angles, and think about what you find. Do that with every game you play and all the media you consume.